seated and happy Mother's Day once again. Before I begin my homily this morning, I want to comment briefly on the recent news regarding the Supreme Court and specifically on two aspects of that situation. First of all, the leak, and secondly, the reaction to the leak. I believe that the leak of the court's pending ruling in the Dobbs v. Jackson case, a ruling which would, in effect, overrule and rescind Roe v. Wade, is one more example of the corruption that has infested so many of our institutions in recent years, especially so many of our government institutions. And by the way, despite what you may have heard from so many sources, the result of rescinding Roe v. Wade would be to allow each state legislature to formulate its own state laws regarding abortion. Nothing more, nothing less. Secondly, we have seen a reaction from the pro-abortion side to that potential ruling, including from many in the media and many Democrat office holders, not the least of which came from the President of the United States, a reaction that is both so dishonest and so outrageous that it illustrates once more the demonic nature of support for killing unborn babies in the womb. It has, in effect, become a demonic obsession for many, many people in our culture. And if the official ruling by the court is as expected, we should anticipate an even greater flood of evil reaction in our nation. So my encouragement to you this morning as I bring these remarks to a close is to pray, to pray for our nation, and to be prepared to respond in love, in humility, and above all, in truth. Heeding the words of St. Paul, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, now to my homily. I'd like to back up a few verses to the logical beginning of today's gospel passage from John chapter 10. I'm going to back up to, to verse 22 because that really is the logical beginning of this, uh, this account. It was the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in, in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. The religious leaders had already begun to turn on Jesus in a very concerted way because he had not met their expectations, their preconceived notions of who and what the Messiah should be. They were hostile toward him and they felt acutely frustrated by him because they could neither ignore him nor explain him away. Plus Jesus, knowing the evil intent of their hearts, continually refused to answer their calculated questions directly and spoke to them in parables whose real meanings he revealed only to those, he, those who believe, primarily his disciples. And so here, Jesus does not respond to their question in the way that it is asked, because their intent in asking, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly, is not because they're seeking the truth, but because they're seeking to indict him with his own words. In other words, they're trying to catch him up, trip him up. The Gospel record makes it clear that whenever people of goodwill sincerely ask a similar question about Jesus' identity, the Lord always answered directly and forthrightly. In John chapter 4, for example, when the Samaritan woman at the well makes reference to the Messiah who is called Christ, Jesus responds, I who speak to you am He. In John chapter 9, after Jesus healed the man born blind, the man himself asks Jesus, who is the Son of Man, sir, that I may believe in him? 
Jesus responds, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. But in this instance, in John chapter 10, the people asking the question had seen Jesus. They had witnessed his many miracles, signs, and wonders. They had heard his teachings, and yet they continued to ask the same question because they continued in obstinate and deliberate unbelief. And so Jesus responds with these words in verses 25 and 26. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. St. Thomas Aquinas, commenting on this exchange, wrote this, quote, I can see thanks to the light of the sun, but if I close my eyes, I cannot see. This is not the fault of the sun. It is my own fault because by closing my eyes, I prevent the sunlight from reaching me. And so the Lord then moves on quickly to declaring a truth concerning those who do believe in him. And this is the essence of today's gospel on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hands. Do you realize that our Lord is speaking about you and me here? If you're living under the Lordship of Christ, Jesus says you hear his voice. He knows you and you follow him and he gives you eternal life and you shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch you out of his hand. Let's understand something here. When the Lord says he gives us eternal life, he's talking about giving us a share, an intimate participation in his own life. That is the very life of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not giving us something, note, he's not giving us something that he has received from another source. Rather, he gives us that of which he is the source. I am the way and the truth and the life, he says. All life comes from him, and all life owes its very existence to him, all of our lives. And again, the life that he gives to those who believe in him is a share in his own life. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why the Holy Eucharist is so vital in our lives and why the church refers to it as the source and the summit of our faith, the bread of life, the living bread of which Jesus said in John chapter 6, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So then going back to the original quotation, asked of Jesus by the Jews, how does a person today, 2,000 years later, get the question answered, if you are the Christ, tell me plainly? How does a person get that question answered today? Because, you know, we look around us in our world, in our culture, and we see the condition of our society. We see the desperation that exists in so many people's lives. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, we know intuitively of people's deep-seated hunger for authentic spirituality. But we also see so many examples of people looking for that spirituality in all the wrong places. Some of you may remember a story I told some time ago about an experience I had one day in Safeway. Now, as soon as I say that, I realize that a few of you have been assuming that because I'm a priest, groceries miraculously appear, appear on <laughs> our kitchen countertop every week. But no, I go to the supermarket. But anyway, on that particular day in Safeway, I couldn't help but notice a young woman, probably in her 20s, whose path crossed with mine several times. What struck me about her, frankly, was what appeared to be 
first of all, a very angry demeanor and the great lengths that she had gone to to make herself both obvious and unattractive. From her wild, multicolored hairdo to her deliberately ragged clothing, including combat boots, by the way, to her countless piercings and disturbing tattoos. Now, I have to admit, I am a curmudgeon, so that kind of stuff does create a reaction to me, but this one was, was particularly obvious on this particular day. And the thing that stood out the most was her eyes. Her eyes. They were both surrounded with dark painted black circles that made her eyes take on the look of death. I remembered wondering to myself as I saw her, what does it take to make this person created in the image and likeness of God to disfigure herself so? Part of my answer came out in the parking lot as I saw her getting into her little blue car with no less than 15 bumper stickers on the back. Most of them with occult or otherwise anti-Christian symbols and sayings on them, and one in particular that caught my eye which read, born okay the first time. Born okay the first time. In case you don't get that, it's a veiled and cynical declaration of her rejection of Jesus' words in John chapter 3, you must be born again, or you must be born anew in order to enter the kingdom of God. The 17th century French Catholic philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote these words, quote, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. 1,200 years earlier, St. Augustine, the great St. Augustine, wrote something similar in these words, quote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And so let me take a few moments to make this personal by asking you a personal question. Is there a restlessness in your heart this morning? And I'm not talking about the restlessness of the culture, the restlessness of the world, the things that are swirling around us that create anxiety. I'm talking about something a little bit deeper today. Is there a restlessness in your heart this morning that you don't understand and that you can't resolve? Do you lack an abiding sense of inner peace in your life, even though to all outward appearances you've got it all together? Maybe it's a general sense of dissatisfaction and uneasiness and malaise about the state of your own soul. You may be a lifelong Catholic, faithful to all that the church teaches, coming to Mass every Sunday and making regular use of the sacraments and still be restless. A fact that itself may actually make your restlessness all the more frustrating because you don't understand why your faithfulness and your devotion don't resolve the restlessness. Well, if that is an apt description of where you find yourself today, I want to encourage you with a very basic but very crucial truth. Are you ready for it? Here it is. The answer to what you are seeking is Jesus. Now, don't say to me, well, duh. Because you may be thinking, what? I know who Jesus is. I know a lot about him. I've even taught others about him. And by the way, I receive him every Sunday in the Eucharist. I understand that, and I'm in no way diminishing or dismissing any of that. That's all important, of course. It's all vital for our life of faith. 
But what I am suggesting is that if you are doing all that and you still have a restless heart, there is a dimension to our faith that you may not yet have discovered. And here it is. Jesus is offering you the incalculable gift of friendship with himself. Friendship with the very Son of God. A personal, intimate relationship with the one who created you and who desires to spend eternity with you. And who for that purpose died for you, redeemed you from sin and death and Satan, and is calling you to walk with him in this life and ultimately to enjoy everlasting peace and joy with him in heaven. Pope St. John Paul II wrote this. Note this carefully. Quote, Sometimes even Catholics have lost or never had the chance to experience Christ personally. It is necessary to awaken again in believers a full relationship with Christ." End quote. And then we have these words from Pope Benedict XVI, quote, Our knowledge of Jesus is in need above all of a living experience. We ourselves must be personally involved in an intimate and profound relationship with Jesus. End quote. In his book entitled Evangelical Catholicism, George Weigel stated this, quote, Friendship with Jesus Christ is the raison d'etre of the church. The church exists to offer the possibility of personal friendship with the Lord Jesus, the acceptance of which leads both to the truth about God and to the richest imaginable human life, end quote. If that prospect thrills you this morning, then I encourage you before you leave church today, in fact, specifically when you approach the communion rail to receive the Holy Eucharist in a few moments, ask the Lord through the grace of today's Eucharist for a real, personal, intimate relationship and revelation of himself to you. Tell him how much you desire that personal relationship with him, friendship with him, and then let him do the rest by his Holy Spirit. Let him do the rest by his Spirit. If you yearn for a life transformed, or as George Weigel puts it, the richest imaginable human life, if you yearn for that, and you should. That life is one that is lived in the knowledge and friendship of the one true and living God in Christ Jesus. Ask him to give it to you today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.